So I think I th that I can Yeah, it's just loading. Mm -hmm. Yes, now you can start. Nina? Firstly, I want to say good uh, evening for everybody and uh, to say that I'm glad to be here to participate in such activity today with my um, topic about smart city transport planning in Moscow and case study on public transport, transit hubs and park and drive facilities. First of all, First of all, I want to say some words about my university. No, no, in such way. My university and me. So, Moscow State University of Civil Engineering. It is the biggest university in Russia. That in its activity, in its educational and the research activities, covers all. Um, what is my, this is my presentation? <laughs> uh, covers the whole life cycle of the construction objects in the city. So, urban planning it is the first stage of this uh, life cycle, and uh, our area of educational activities and our area of research lays in this area. Transport planning. Transport planning, it is of course very important part of this, pro of this process because if we will compare uh, every city with the uh, organism, we will understand that transport is their blood. That's why we are, uh, do try our best to develop this, uh, to develop this, um, to develop this, uh, uh, direction in our urban planning. So I am a head of this department of urban planning and uh, not long ago I defend my doctoral thesis also in this field. And today I want to share you our experience and our activities. First of all we should uh, understand the Moscow transport situation because it's quite uh, specific. Um, so, what is this? Moscow city is the capital of our country. Moscow city it is the center of our country. Moscow city it is the center of Moscow region and Moscow agglomeration. Here on this slide you can see the borders of this Moscow agglomeration and they are defined by this transport sector. The borders are defined by the factor of distribution of population with labor places in Moscow city. So on this slide you can see the gradation of red color from light to very, very dark red uh, color. And this color means uh, the ratio of population who are living in this area but are working in Moscow city. This situation uh, generates Moscow city transport collapse, especially in peak hours, hours because a lot of people uh, every morning do their daily labor trips to the Moscow city and in the evening they uh, return to their home. So on the photos on this slide you can see the result of such situation the red color on the uh, city uh, map uh, defines the transport congestion in the city and on the photos you can see the, a common situation uh, as on the streets of our city you can see this very big number of cars and both uh, on our public transport system on rail and metro station a lot of people uh, if we will count them the number of population in Moscow city, it is more than uh, 12 million people plus uh, 6 million people who live on the territory of Moscow agglomeration in Moscow suburb. Such situation uh, defines our transport policy of our city. On this slide I try my best to collect and to very briefly describe uh, the main um, the main activities of our transport policy for our city. 
First of all, it is of course the development of public transport city, you know, transport, public transport system. In Moscow, there are more than uh, six modes of different public transport: on land and uh, rated rail transport, buses, trolley buses, trams, uh, metro, light rail, city rail, commuter rail. All these public uh, modes of public transport have their priority. Um, on the roads, on the streets of our city, and on these uh, photos, you can see the quality of this system. It really uh, works very good, and uh, it provides more than 70% of all mobility in the city. The another direction very important for our city because uh, Moscow and Moscow agglomeration is a very big uh, system of settlement is of course our rail. So we try our best to develop a road and street network in the most sustainable way. On these photos you can see the um, quality of our roads and the intersections of, um, that we have, and if we are speaking about the city, we have very strict system of managing of this uh, car access uh, to the streets and to the territories of our city. There are a lot of different users of the city streets, cars, pedestrians, uh, cyclists, uh, and the non-motorized uh, modes of transport. And all the all these uh, users should be uh, managed. Should be managed. The third very uh, important direction it is of course green uh, design solution for urban environment. So, as Moscow is a very big city, it is very important for us to create such environment for sustainability of our city. This environment it is. Um, uh, it is uh, the result of adapting our city to climate change. It is uh, the result of uh, providing ec ecological safety of population who live in such a big city. There are a lot of population, there are a lot of guests of our city, businessmen, uh, tourists, and they all uh, can find their own place on our city streets. And here, on these uh, photos, you can see the quality of these spaces. We try to develop not only the uh, only uh, traffic function of our streets, but also to develop public function of our streets to provide this very active public life of the city, of uh, population of the city on it. And the next, and the last one, the last one di direction, it is, of course, concerning smart technologies because it is the uh, main idea of uh, city management. When we are speaking about smart uh, city, we are speaking about the city uh, which we can manage, in which all processes that we have in the city we can manage. So these smart technologies, they unite all uh, process, transport processes in the city in one united and integrated system, and we are proud of it. We have a very developed uh, managing traffic managing center that provides us a lot of uh, information about car traffic and about the working of public uh, transport. So it's the full maintenance uh, of um, city mobility uh, in the streets for different kinds of users. And the, uh, and the focus of my topic, or the focus of my report today, I want to make on the base um, thing of our city mobility in the city. It is public uh, system of public transport transit hubs and park and ride facilities. Why it is the base? Because for such a big uh, city as Moscow, we have to develop public transport, uh, public transport transportation. Uh, so for this, our authorities, and we are proud that we take part uh, in this process, develop the system of uh, public transport transit hubs where all kinds of uh, different transport, transport um, are integrated in one system. Park and ride facilities, it is a very important part of this uh, public transport transit hub. 
because it is the um, mode that provides the intercepting of car owners and transferring them to the public transport. If we will evaluate the result of such activity, we will understand that we can uh, intercept more than 10 percent of car mobility in the city and to transfer these people to public transport system. For Moscow, it is a very important thing because it's the uh, straight uh, way how to uh, solve the transport problem in Moscow. The system of park and drive facilities that we develop now on our department consists of more than uh, 100 uh, different uh, kinds of park, park and drive facilities as regional, city and local ones. And on the photos on this slide, you can see uh, some photos of our public transport transit hubs. They are very new, quite new and very comfortable. And there are also two photos of these park and ride uh, facilities that our car owners can use and they do it with great pleasure. This service is very famous between car owners because it really uh, provides their um, in decreasing of time cost for them. But also, if we are speaking about smart city and Moscow is a smart city, I should say that all this process of intercepting of these car owners and transferring them to the public transport have, have uh, this maintenance with smart technologies. Our car drivers has, have this um, access to uh, mobile apps and they can plan uh, their trip online using different uh, apps. So it is a very short uh, observation of the uh, topic that I want to um, present you today. It is very uh, pity that I don't have enough time because there are a lot of different information about that. There, I should uh, say that uh, sustainable urban mobility it is quite a big topic for us in our educational area and in the researches. We have a lot of different pro projects and research projects in which we participate both in our country and in international projects too. So, but I think that you can contact me and I will try to my best to answer all questions that you will have uh, to me concerning my topic. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nina. Thank you so much for giving us an overview of the public transportation and uh, the park and ride systems for, for in Moscow. Um, we will move on to the next presentation uh, of Katya Sheshna and then in the end we will take questions from the audience. Uh, I also see that people have already started writing in their questions. Thank you so much. We will pick um, as many questions as possible in the Q&A round. Thanks. Let's move on to the next presentation. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, could I get a quick feedback, Adashri, if you can all hear me? Yes, Katya. You're audible, very clear. Very clear. Okay, that's lovely. Uh, I'm very much uh, impressed by what we've heard and especially um, uh, I've worked in Moscow before and I've seen the transformation in the last few years and it's been really astounding and we are also all very hopeful that even though we see an increased motorization in countries like India, we do hope that there is a rethinking and the possibility to embrace traditional modes of transportation to make things like cycling more uh, accepted, more socially uh, preferred and also easier and more safe. So that I was very impressed and very interested in the presentation Shahar uh, shared with us. What I like to do today is give you a little glimpse of the future about encoding 21st century transport and 
and how the new ideas and the new possibilities of technology that has been in two aspects that I really appreciate uh, and two, two transport projects in India being shown recently, like Rivigo Transport and the Adhar system. But let me start a little bit earlier on why we think that data is the new concrete. Um, what you see here is a, a quote by Silita Reynolds. She is the general manager of the Department of Transportation of LA, a city notorious for its traffic and notorious for its car orientation. She said, we used to think of our responsibility as delivering and managing roads, sidewalks, streetlights, bridges, tunnels and tracks, the hard infrastructure of cities. And we did this on a decadal time scale. But now code is the new concrete. The infrastructure is algorithmic and the city must deliver it instantaneously. What do we mean by that? We live in an age of acceleration. Things go and change a lot faster as they did compared to in the past. And we also live in an age of con concurrence. Things come together. So until very recently, mobility, as difficult as it still is and was to manage, we had people who took care of the public transport, we had people who managed the roads and put the cars, there's the aviation sector, there's the maritime and ship sector, there's the delivery sector, the long, uh, the, the trains uh, connecting cities and also light rail in the cities and cycling and walking, difficult enough but separate. And then uh, something happened. A new layer of digitalization and new technologies began to kind of sink about from above from the clouds down to earth and, and start connecting uh, those things. What we see is with this digitalization, new, you could say, modes of transport become, became um, suddenly available you know about Uber, about Grab, about Didi Shishin, you know about uh, the changes in on-demand public transport, about car, car sharing, about uh, suddenly scooter and e-scooter sharing, about even uh, drones and micromobility, but um, a multitude of different transportation modes suddenly um, exploded. It was not necessarily modes, but new forms of layers and organization, something that people living in uh, the global south um, with its more lively and more kaleidoscopic way of getting things done and moving things from A to B are a bit more used to. But of course, for the very rigid models, let's say in the US or in Europe, this was a new thing. But at the same time, another thing happened. We suddenly have new engines, whether it's electric engines, whether it's uh, hybrid engines, whether it's uh, new kind of fuels that you have, and they disperse through nearly all modes. And while we are still kind of figuring out how to build the new infrastructure so that you can charge your electric car or your hybrid car or whatever, another thing happened, and that is automation. I'm pretty sure all of you have heard and, and are constantly expecting the real automated and self-driving cars and trucks and whatever on the roads. So within less than 20 years, we've had a proliferation of opportunities, of modes, of all these kinds of things. So um, it is a real... Uh, new world and a quick acceleration of things that are happening. And while we are still talking about this, the next step is clearly already there. It's the artificial intelligence. It's the knowing on where people are going. It's what they expect, who and what uh, will need an anticipation of transport modes that will come or that they will need. So the whole system, a very complex system, could um, uh, react and interweave with each other a lot more. 
However, when we think about all of this, we see we are living in an age of convergence. You cannot really distinguish private and public transportation anymore because what is a shared car? Is it a private good? Is it a public good? Is it part of regulations of the public transportation or not? What about shared bike systems or e-scooters? What kind of uh, technology, the technology that binds them together is basically digitalization and information, and we need to shape this. Um, I hope, uh, and I think many of you have heard about Jan Gale, who has been really instrumental in wrangling our cities back from the cars and giving public spaces back to people. And one of his famous quotes is that first, we shape our cities, but then they shape us. They, they, they make our behavior. And what I'm proposing is that we need to be now very careful because it will be soon that first we write the code and then the code writes us. So the way we make, we design, we implement and use digital systems or the code um, is of high importance to us. Let me show you an example. When we think about the future of urban mobility, what we can really, and I've done a lot of studies on learning from the global source, South, we can learn from embracing informality and mixing them with the new technology and algorithms to design and manage streets or specifically the curbs next to the sidewalks as flexible, dynamic, and self-adjusting spaces. Take a break, okay? And in your mind, think of a future where the cars were automated, so they were self-driving. If no one you had his or her own car, because basically your whole city would be operating on a shared mobility service, whether it's public transportation or whether it's kind of taxi or Uber service, or whether it's a rickshaw that picks you up, okay? And how would that look like? So currently, when you think about cities, you have the road, then you have the curb space, and then you have the sidewalk where things are separated. And at least, at least, unfortunately, in the cities of Europe and the US and in many other cities that I've lived in uh, in Asia as well, when it comes to Shanghai or Manila, where I lived for three years, we basically use this curb now a lot just for vehicle storage. But what would it be if the curb was a flexible use zone? If driven by the algorithms, we could use it at different times of day uh, for different kinds of uses, that would somehow self-organize because the machines in the background would negotiate it. So at a certain time of day, it would be basically a delivery zone or for goods delivery, for large goods delivery, or for people who have to pick up and go early to work or not. And then later in the day, in the morning, it, you can use it flexibly because you don't need to store the cars there anymore because they are automated and they always are in circle to, to, to work there. You could have still a little bit of goods delivery, but you could also have a breakfast capacity and you make stations for high capacity public transportation. Next step, different time of day, different kind of uses from food trucks to little automated buses, because at that time of day, we know that we don't need like large buses, but maybe at that time of day in this particular set, uh, city, smaller automated buses can go around. And for those that really need individual services, you still have the right service, the Uber or the Didi Shishing. And um, then again, later in the evening, it changes. Uh, but while we are all thinking of this and while we are all focused very much on the ground, a new technology, a new innovation is happening and that is drones and that is urban air mobility. And I do know that we think at the moment that this is kind of a, you know, a strange fun thing and like we can't really imagine how it would look like in cities. But this is something that I'm working on at the moment. What is the future if 
we put a new layer, a new layer of automated because it's self-flying, it, it, it doesn't need a pilot on board, it is electric and it can be shared mobility service on top. How would our cities look like? So this is the city now. Would it be that everywhere drones can land? Would it be that on every window they can, on every uh, um, uh, rooftop, on everywhere on the ground? Or is it not more another and a new service? and a new technology that really promises hope, especially in densely populated areas, in the slums that you see in, like my city, Manila, has a strong slum, where you could deliver goods, you could deliver emergency services, and I'm not talking about passenger drones for super rich people because they wouldn't um, really help us, but especially with goods and service transport, it could help us. But this needs to be carefully managed. And this is some of the work that I'm currently doing about drones in the world of tomorrow. And I want you really to think about, I know we have so much problems on the ground. The future of Air transportation could help us, but if we don't properly manage it, we, it, it's another big problem that we just add on the ground. Therefore, um, we need to think and be very nimble and very humble when we do regulations for urban transportation on, um, uh, for future innovation. And um, I've been seeing a few questions in the side about COVID and the, the um, the impact on shared transportation and the impact on regulation and all these kinds of things. That means that all the people who work in administration need to create in the future adaptive regulations, maybe try it out first in regulatory sandboxes. This is nothing new. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire in 1870 first implemented a new whole law that governed all people in a certain area, tried and tested what worked out there, and then moved it to other areas in the world. This is what we mean with regulatory sandboxes. Try it out first, learn, and then make it a rule and a regulation for everyone. Outcome-based regulation. Don't try to tell people how exactly they have to write the code, but tell them what the code needs to deliver risk and collaborative uh, regulation really becomes important as well, especially if we think about a future when the digital systems can basically anticipate what the humans want and interact and um, deliver it already uh, um, before we even think about it. Um, because in the end, and that's very important in our everyday work is, that first we imagine the future and then we make it so. So we really need to be careful about thinking what futures we imagine to actually be able to deliver better futures. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Katya. That was, uh, that was a very interesting presentation and really cool ideas um, and models. Um, I'm sure the audience enjoyed that. Um, um, we uh, will move to the questions now. So I would uh, ask everyone to join with their uh, cameras one more time, the speakers. Um, and then we can move to the questions. Yeah, it will just take a second while we change the formats. Just give us one moment and thank you everyone for being patient with uh, with us today with the with the tool it just takes us a second to readjust and um, now as a subject expert um, I'm going to um, ask Sharif to um, do the panel discussion and take a couple of questions from the audience and also steer the steer the steer the you know discussion ahead. Um, Sharif, are you here? Nonetheless, we should go ahead. Yes, I think. Sharif, can you hear me?
Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. 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 No. So, uh, now we are visible. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, thank you, Adishri, and uh, yeah. thanks everyone for uh, a very informative presentation uh, from uh, each of the speakers. Uh, uh, I have, uh, to begin with, I have a few questions for uh, the speakers, uh, and then maybe later on we can take questions from uh, the audience who have mentioned uh, in the chat box. Um, and, and the first question, which is also uh, which has also come uh, from a large number of uh, audiences, is the impact of COVID that has had on urban mobility in each of uh, the speakers' city or uh, area of research that people um, that speakers are engaged in. So, if if uh, uh, Katya, if you can start first, and then maybe Nina after that, what has been the impact of COVID on urban mobility? Um, Sharif, I'm sorry, I didn't really get the question. It, it's, I, I, it's primarily I, I, I the Maybe Can you hear me now? So, yeah, How so impact of COVID on urban mobility is, is a larger, yeah. Ah, <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky with this question because um, the International Transport Forum, we made a COVID brief about how different areas in the world reacted in urban mobility, so how different uh, cities reacted. It's uh, online, it's shareable, and it's just a 10-pager that really tells you the different reactions, the different ways cities reacted in when the public transport had to be kept, but how you managed it like how you manage social distancing, how we, how we changed, and in many cities, and you could see this globally, from Bogota to Paris to cities in Vietnam, how the more informal transportation, like how being more walkable and cyclable, like pop-up um, uh, bike lanes, pop-up pop pedicab and rickshaw lanes, um, suddenly uh, exploded so that people could get around without being confined um, to those spaces. However, as much as we've seen a lot of nimble, very clever things that have been done, I mean, I'm probably sure you have even seen the, the motor taxis, you know, where you sit on a, on a two-wheeler with a driver and that takes you around Nairobi or that takes you around cities in, in, in Thailand, they even developed rucksacks with shields so that the drivers and passengers, at least the most common uh, affection of, of transmitting could, could be done. So we've seen a lot of nimble things, but we need to be honest. And being honest means while we've seen a lot of good things, a lot of good things and a lot of good organization that helps with decarbonization, with biking, with those things. We see the numbers of people using public transportation go down, and we do see the number of private cars and using private cars for commuting go up. And I, I honestly must say it is very difficult when we think about climate change, about congestion, and about all those things. But unless we will find something to either medicate or vaccinate COVID against, it is a reality that public transportation systems will need to live with for a while. And the best way to ameliorate it at the moment is what governments can do is that those people who can actually work together uh, at home, like, like we basically do now, work from home. But it will be a difficult phase and we will also face the problem of weaning people from the convenient cars again in the future. I, I'm sorry, I would love to give better news and, and you know, in Vienna or New York, we all have now outdoor cafes and use the bikes, but for public transportation, it's a hit and it's a hit that will stay for a while. Do you want to take on the question? You're on mute if you want. 
Okay, we can't hear you. So, it's okay? So, my opinion on this topic. Uh, I was a participant of this situation with COVID uh, pandemic time. And uh, uh, I should say that this time, this two months is when the Moscow was empty without any cars, only public transport, no people, no children, no traffic. It was very unusual, but we all understand that it was some kind of disaster. Now the situation is quite normal. We return to our daily life with our transport congestion and a lot of people in metro and in buses and very intensive way of mobility. Uh, the very interesting question, what will uh, be in future? Will uh, public transport uh, Will it be in the priority of development, or maybe it will increase the number of cars, or cars, or individual cars on the streets of our city? It is a very interesting question, and we have been discuss have discussed this question in many, many different discussions. Uh, what uh, What is my opinion? Now it is not time to decide what we should do in future. We should wait. We should wait how the situation will develop in time. Because all transport policy depends, all activities in transport policy, of course, depend on the population behavior. So how people will live in future. What, uh, what they will do with their mobility, what they will do with their life. Will they, uh, will they continue to work uh, remotely or maybe they return to their normal uh, larva places? Uh, it is, I think that we will uh, evaluate the situation only after the situation with uh, COVID will uh, end fully and totally. Now it's not, this, uh, it's not uh, the end. We are only in the, maybe in the middle of this uh, way. Uh, that's why I think that it is very early to make some prognosis. But what I uh, see on the uh, Moscow example, in the Moscow experience, for Moscow development of public transport, it is the only way how to solve our problem. And we can't uh, forget about it. That's why maybe we should uh, we should think about the increasing of quality of our public transport, in decreasing the uh, density of passengers in in uh, it. And uh, this quality of public transport and transport service on this public transport will provide the safe conditions for people even in the on such a difficult period as covid but uh, i hope i will hope that this situation will never return to us uh, thank you uh, both of you about your uh, perspective on the impact of covid on urban mobility uh, I just hope that people carry on with the positive side of urban mobility in terms of cycling and non-motorized transportation uh, beyond COVID days uh, and give up the negative sides, uh, which is uh, a short-term increase in personalized vehicle usage, uh, two-wheelers and four-wheelers. Uh, I just hope that. Uh, and, and there is a study that was done uh, for a city of Hong Kong um, and uh, in early 2000, when uh, I think SARS broke out, and uh, the study was done by Professor uh, Graham Curry of, uh, of uh, Australian University, uh, and and the positive side is that the impact uh, on public transportation is short time, short lived. Uh, people do tend to move back to uh, public transportation uh, for their daily usage, uh, which I hope that. It happens for uh, all uh, the countries and all the cities in the world uh, this time again. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, 
I have one more uh, question. Maybe after that we can move on um, to the to the questions from the audience. Um, in terms of you know going forward, uh, what are the two or three key areas of uh, urban mobility and transportation in general which the authorities and the government should focus on? I know uh, both of you have alluded to those uh, topics, but two critical two top two. uh interventions that the government should take to make transport sustainable karja uh, if you want to take that first you are in mute uh, um <clears throat> i have two answers to this and one is usually the i am sorry dear city mayor and dear transport it is not two important things you must do you must understand that for the future you must get the 120 things or 340 things right what you are asking me is to give you the two most important ingredients for bread but you forget that you also need an oven and a coal and everything around it and water and a pan to make it and fry it so there is not two most important things that cities can do the one most important thing that the urban policy makers must understand is that we have a system a large network and that we need to carefully balance invest and think in all of it it's we will not save the world if we invest in underground tunnels or in metros or in co2 taxation for all private it, it's not like one thing or two things that will help us anything anything that you can think of that will help us to get to a better future whether it's a little but it's three bikes or the investment in in a better public transportation system or in a taxation or in 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 having only sustainable energy generation for mobility all of this you must do and not one thing i'm very sorry to your policy makers the time when you could do three most important things is gone you had this chance it's 2020 better do everything and that's true for public you need to have everything Dear little thing, and all the mayors to do all. Uh, thank you for your uh, comment on that. I totally agree uh, with the pace at which we are moving in terms of impacting uh, climate and environment. Uh, it is not uh, that one intervention or two interventions that could uh, bring up change. Uh, there needs to be a whole okay or array of. uh interventions that are required uh, right uh, from a uh, city level perspective to a uh, uh, more state level perspective to a more country level perspective uh so uh, and 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 glad that you have been uh, quite frank about the interventions uh, that are required and the urgency of uh, the same uh, from the government side because each passing day uh, the risk of you know uh, not reversing uh, the change is is high uh, so so thank you for that uh, nina you want to take on uh, uh, i'll probably rephrase the question and then maybe what is the you know uh, what should the government do uh, not maybe in a, you know one or two ways but what should the government focus on surely i am fully agree with you and with katya of course uh, you are right you are fully right uh, my opinion is the same but i can focus my um, attention on this thing that transport planning is only the part of very complex uh, urban development process and of course all that we do in our cities we should, should orient it on social uh, welfare of population and their safety and comfortability and sustainability and a lot of different uh, words that can uh, describe uh, our life 
our best uh, conditions of sustaining of uh, our life being it is the main idea of any transport planning uh, activity and the transport transport planning is only the part of this very big process great, great. Uh, thank you for that uh, we have few questions from uh, the audience uh, i have made a note of it uh, i am told that we have only have 15 minutes and uh, we'll hopefully wrap up uh, by uh, in 15 minutes time uh, so we have few questions uh, one uh, common question to both uh, Katya and uh, Nina is that how uh, is climate resilience factored in urban planning uh, in, in the cities uh, and how important that uh, aspect is this was from Mr. Vinod Nina you want to take it first you you are in mute. You are in mute. Nina, you are in mute. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. So sorry. Okay. Okay. So when we are speaking about urban resilience, of course, we are speaking about some uh, environmental issues. As we will discuss the experience of uh, Moscow, uh, our city and our country may be in very good situation if we will compare, for example, with the India. We have very small uh, effect of climate change. We don't have a lot of natural hazards and disasters. Uh, Moscow city it is the mo it is one of the most green cities uh, in the world we have a lot of different greenings and accomplishments uh, in our city and uh, we try what is the main uh, direction in, po in not only in transport policy but in urban policy totally to provide the development of this process to make it more better to make it more comfortable for people in this way, if we are speaking about resilience of uh, our Russia experience, on the uh, example of Moscow, it is not such very big or actual question, but of course we can try to pay a lot of attention for it because it is about the safety of our population. Sadhu, you want to take it? I think that, yeah. um, um, it is for where, whatever city globally we are thinking of, we must have first an assessment what are the real risks. So at, when I've worked in Asia, we had flooding risks. I know you talk about this tomorrow. This is essential. This is important. It recurs all the time. You have to prepare for this. But we need to be careful. Um, I've been involved in the, present, in the, in the preparation of um, preparing for some really awful things like the potential of war or the potential of uh, a flood or let's say an asteroid hitting the earth. And when you really start thinking through it, you cannot prepare a city for the worst, like for the absolute worst worst, because then it wouldn't function anymore. You would have to, you know, prepare everything. So I think what I actually think as, as awful as this pandemic is, we see that how extremely resilient the people in the cities were and many in many cities and especially those cities in the global so south that have these informal networks that already know a little bit more on how things work. They were very resilient and could tackle this specific problem. Um, and we will need to learn about this and learn where, like if you look at uh, Vietnam or Thailand, they, they did 
splendid in, in this in this pandemic uh, what we can and can do and also of course um, and I agree with Nina I mean the incredible beauty and the and the amount of having actually public space that's not sold to real estate developers and that you have the green parks and the wide avenues helps you in many many cases uh, you always have to consider what resilience you want to plan for balance it and then go for a hundred year risk, but probably don't prepare for those things that have happened every thousand years because it's the life. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. So we have seen, uh, you know, over the last 30 years, uh, you know, in terms of carbon emissions, if we see uh, during the entire human civilization, uh, so we have contributed to the equivalent of uh, that in the past 30 years alone uh, in terms of CO2 emissions and the frequency of extreme events based, uh, on account of climate change has uh, increased uh, dra drastically. Uh, this is true for India, this is true for US, this is true for European countries as well, uh, South Asia. You take any part of the world and these extreme events have, uh, the frequency of that has increased uh, drastically. Uh, one way is, uh, of course, to reduce emission, and the other way, which, as you mentioned, uh, Karja, in terms of how resilient people have, uh, the tendency of people becoming resilient to uh, all those factors, that plays an important role uh, in, in, our, in our city uh, planning and city development uh, going forward. So thank you for that. Um, there, there are two uh, more broad questions. Uh, one is with regard to cycling infrastructure and how cycling uh, would play a role. Of course, there are a few uh, India-specific questions which, which I would be happy to take. Uh, but if there is any uh, interventions on in terms of cycling, uh, how and what kind of role does it play, and what the authorities should do uh, in terms of promoting cycling, uh, what are your take uh, on that? Uh, Nina, you want to take it first? What what about cycling in our Moscow in Russia as we have a very cold winter? Uh, there is the question of, of uh, development of uh, cycling. It's very um, interesting and quite new for us, uh, but it is one of the very interesting and uh, actual uh, directions in the development of transport policy. Every year, a lot of people try their best to use bicycles not all, only for recreational aims but also for labor and trips and um, I should mention that uh, on the COVID uh, uh, pandemic period bicycle was one of the most popular uh, modes of transport but uh, we still have not uh, developed infrastructure for cyclists and the, and the problem is that we can use a bicycle only three months a year in a comfortable way. Another, all another seasons are cold and not uncomfortable to use this. That's why it is a very interesting question, but uh, I should mention that uh, cycling in the world, it is one of the most interesting and famous uh, mode of transport, especially in uh, modern conditions. So I think we have uh, only one way to develop such a system. But when we, are, when we uh, see uh, pictures of India with, with this uh, cycling in very good uh, weather, when the uh, sun is shining, I have some jealous uh, for, for you, it's true. Satya, you want to take that? Just on Moscow, it's of course true. When we think about cycling, we must always think about the climate or the weather in this specific locality. Um, uh, everybody knows about Amsterdam, people are cycling there all year, or yes, they have winters too, yes, it's rainy, but you know, it's kind of, it's also like a compact and smaller city. So it's like, 
um, I think people can widen their need of comfort a bit. I mean, like you can cycle when it's hot, you can cycle when it's raining or so, but of course at a certain point you hit, you can't, I mean, cycling in a monsoon is difficult or cycling in a, in a Moscow winter, and I love winters, is, is difficult too. So we, we must think about it, but again, I come back to what I've said before. Even if it helps to have a pop-up cycle way just in summer in Moscow and it reduce the four lanes to three lanes, so you have one. It already helps for four or five months in summer. You know, kind of, we, 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 we must um, move away from this one solution to rule them all, the one ring that saves the world, and understand that we have many options and can use that. And, and if you would allow me, one of the most fantastic things that I will and, and really working, we are all working to introduce this, to learn this from the India, Pakistan, Bangladesh areas in the world is the rickshaw or the pedicab systems where people pedal, but if you are too old or too tired or too young or you have to transport, someone paddles you and ideally maybe with electric support if it becomes too heavy. This is light, nimble um, vehicle. They are light, they are not like a ton of metal like a car, they are small and nimble. It, it, they are much better for the environment, for the climate. It's not cycling yourself, it, it gets assist or it's a service, so you always have it when you need it. And I think we must understand and we should embrace this tradition and I, I'm very sorry to also see that this tradition is losing out in India, in, in many other countries because it's not considered modern or cool anymore or things. I think we should value one of those traditional modes of transport and use modern technology and modern ideas to bring it to, to now to help us. So maybe cycling and pedicabs and make it work at least for part of the year. Uh, so, um, in India we do face, uh, we see a lot of rain, uh, but uh, believe me, it's uh, quite uh, something to cycle in rain as well. So, I do experience it whenever I get a chance uh, to do that. Uh, it, it's quite liberating at times. Um, uh, one uh, last question um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, list of questions that has been shared by uh, people on the chat box. One common question is uh, the stigma around uh, the use of public transport. Uh, you know, people don't use it because they don't want to see themselves you know, using public transport sometimes. So how do we break that? Um, uh, is there any magic pills around that? So, so how do we, you want, Kajay, you want to take it? Um, it's, um... 25 years ago, um, I've, I've lived in a student um, dorm and we, we, we had two rooms and then we always invited the guests from somewhere over and then this one day I had this South African guy coming to stay. Just so waiting for Karja to respond. Uh, otherwise, uh, Nina, you want to take it? Do you hear Katya, I hear yes. you and I think that you should uh, end your... Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, shall we? Sharif, can you hear me? Hello. Thank you. So I hear from Ashiri, I'm audible. Okay. So there is this guy from South Africa and he goes for an internship Please in Austria. Go ahead, with regards. And yes, uh, I can hear. So, and this guy, we tell him, we show him around and we tell him how, what public transport he has to use to go to his internship. And he's like, I'm not, I can't use public transportation. I mean, public transportation is for the absolute poor. I need a car, I need a taxi service. Who goes on public transportation? You get killed there. And we were Viennese and we were like, you can use something else than public transportation? Uh, we don't know anyone who has a car. So it's a culture thing. It's an extreme culture thing, of course, the way it's provided. The investment in public transportation and make it clear that it's a, 
it's it's a good thing you benefit and you also have to, of course to provide the quality of the of the public transportation if you are in like this in hot sweaty areas okay no way but if you invest in the quality of public transportation and if you target the young people before they get the illusion that they need their own car um, we have this guy was so fed I mean like he went back to South Africa and told everybody like buses are uh, rock and, and and they should develop this transportation so it's it's a mind shift it's a cultural mind shift and some places in the world got lucky a little bit earlier like Paris uh, or New York and some got a little unlucky um, but I think everybody understands we need to shift in this in this way yet and if I had I know it's a question of, of money but could you probably abolish calling something third class train service for the really poor I mean invest in that quality first before you invest in the quality for the super rich people who can probably afford a helicopter anyway and they shouldn't yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks thanks for your uh, frank answer uh, Kardia. Um, I totally agree in terms of it, it is a cultural change that we need to bring it on uh, to people and people should feel that responsibility uh, towards climate and environment. Uh, there, was, there was one slide on my presentation which mentioned about uh, the bus penetration level per thousand uh, people and uh, there were only two countries which had a uh, bus penetration of five uh, per thousand. Uh, rest were very low at that uh, level, uh, so so uh, as they were the lucky ones to have more buses in, in their system. Um, Nina, you all this all this have words because I fully agree with Katya. As for experience of Moscow, I should say that seventy million, seventy percent of all population use public transport as the main mode. Uh, of their mobility and I should think that in peak hours it's not very comfortable because a lot of people and it is overloaded but people have to do this because it's the only way how to be in time in their labor places and, it's, and it is really uh, important. I think that uh, um, people don't want to spend uh, uh, four or five hours uh, in uh, traffic congestions and if they will have this choice how to make their trip cost much to, to decrease their uh, trip cost they will do it even if, if uh, all modes of public transport are not very comfortable. But we are, if we are speaking about sustainability and if we are speaking about high quality of our life uh, this question of uh, increasing the comfortability of public transport will provide all these issues and it's, uh, of course uh, I fully agree with, with Katya in uh, this question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, one last message to, uh, I see a lot of uh, students uh, in the chat, uh, in, the, in the audience and uh, one last message to them would be don't uh, you know fall to the urge of purchasing that first car uh, use public transport uh, <laughs> sorry Sorry, now I think I'm audible. Uh, it's just like a couple of places where you have to switch on your microphone. Um, always right. So I was saying wonderful presentations, uh, wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Um, Katya, Nina, Sharif, thanks Sharif also for taking up the moderation with and we could go on and on with the number of questions that we've got today uh, from the audience. Uh, but unfortunately, we have less time. Um, but I want to thank all the audience uh, uh, as well for joining us uh, here and uh, um, we're, we're going to ask a couple of things to the audience to do like give us a short feedback and I would request the speakers to stay back um, while we do that uh, but while we're still in the video mode a uh, big thank you this was a great international perspective for us um, and thank you for putting up with all the technical glitches that we had today we were 
Um, I'm not sure if you know things work out, but uh, somehow it turned out so well. Uh, I think uh, probably it was even worth it in the beginning, all the trouble. Uh, let me say that. So great inputs. Uh, I hope we can connect in this round one more time for uh, for your you know inputs, and we can uh, take up a discussion again. Uh, I request you to stay back, uh, speakers, while I just uh, give one a couple of more questions to the uh, uh, few more instructions to the audience. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who's joined in today and stayed back in the end. Thanks a lot for all your questions. Um, I would uh, just request the audience to give us a short feedback before we go, um, and also that this uh, presentation, like the, the the information that was shared here. Uh, the links and also the web talk will be made available for you um, later on in a few, in like in a few days. It will also be on our website for you to reference, uh, and you can you can look up the work of uh, all the speakers that we had. So I'm going to move to the uh, feedback um, slide right now. Um, I request all the participants to give us a short feedback, which also has a question on you know what could be uh, like the next steps if if people want to take up a corporation what could be the areas there um, so it would be nice if you can uh, spare a minute for that so I'm going to move to that slide now thanks a lot uh, we would be uh, grateful if you can give us a short feedback here the poll is now open for everyone We'll keep this open for a couple of minutes. I hope you uh, are able to access it. I hope the participants are able to access the feedback. Yeah, now I think the poll is open. Could you please give us a short feedback on this session? Let us know if you liked it. If there's anything else we can do here, please give us your feedback on, you know, what could be the possible areas of, uh, of cooperation for international research on this topic in the future. Yeah, speakers, you are also welcome to join into this, uh, this poll. Please feel free to give us your views. We'll keep this open for another about 30 seconds. Okay, I think uh, we will close the poll in a few seconds now. If anyone still has one input to give. All right, thank you so much for your feedback. All the participants, thanks a lot once again for joining us. Um, the chat window will be open for a couple of more minutes in case you have um, any um, comments or uh, you know feedback um, you want to leave for us. Uh, some of the files uh, will be available here if they are not already. Uh, please feel free to join us for the next uh, next days um, while we discuss urban flooding and uh, pollution as a part of our cities and climate web talk series. The chat window will be open for another two to three minutes, after which we will close the session. I'm not sure if our colleagues from the other DVEHAs are still around, but if you are still around, um, thank you so much for your support in organizing this web talk. 
um, and getting perspectives from your own countries. I, uh, uh, I'm very glad that this worked out for all of us and we could have such uh, interesting discussions. Thank you for the feedback. Thanks also for the comments that are coming in. We hope to see you at one of our other events in the coming days and coming months. We will close the session soon. The, um, for those of you who are asking, the web talk will be available as a, as a recording in a couple of days.